that brought us all to this room is, is concern <laughs> about the connection between environmental destruction and our food supply. And we see that most clearly with the recent news about the, about the shellfish industry and the fishing industry in the, in the Gulf Coast. So it's absolutely of concern for all of us. And Arun Gupta is here to speak with us about that today. Um, he is one of the founding editors of The Independent, and he's also the author of an upcoming Haymarket Books title about the politics of food. So we should welcome him, and he's going to give us a presentation for about 45 minutes. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks for having me. Um, so the title of my talk is Can We Consume Our Way Out of a Crisis? Uh, and th there's one thing you'll have to bear with me. I was having some printer issues, uh, so I wasn't able to print out my whole talk, so I'm going to have to switch to a computer, which I find annoying. Um, but I'll, I'll try and uh, make it as flow as smoothly as possible. Now, I want to preface it by uh, <laughs> One, one, one framing issue is the rise of cultural politics. Uh, food issues are one area that I talk about, but I think that there is a, a bit of a problem in the rise of cultural politics, is that it becomes a substitute for the, for the decline of working class politics, um, and that the left tries to grab onto to cultural politics, such as television, fashion, sports, food, because it finds itself alienated uh, from the working class, or it doesn't know how to, how to talk to people, or it finds itself in an organizing dead end. So we look to cultural politics as a way to make connections. <clears throat> that doesn't mean that there aren't very serious and, and deep issues there. Um, and I think particularly with food, I think with a lot of the representational politics, such as like fashion and sports, uh, they tend to be a little thin. But I think with something like food, uh, there, there are more serious issues of production um, and of labor that relate, but still I think we need, we need to be aware that this is not a substitute for real working class politics. So when I w walked into the, this uh, opulent hotel yesterday, uh, <laughs> I, I think I came through, uh, I can't remember which entrance, uh, and one of the entrances there's uh, these peacock doors and there's these plaques stating how uh, this is part of this opulent uh, 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 renovation that cost $170 million. Um, then I went up to the bar uh, just to hang out and, and do a little writing, and I was flipping through the bar menu, and I started to notice something um, in terms of the offerings on, on the bar menu. There were terms used such as craft beers, artisanal cheeses, local bacon, country bread, field greens, wild mushrooms, and Michigan turkey. And now, I don't know why Michigan turkey was, is so special, <laughs> you know, why it's so much better than Illinois turkey. Um, but th this, this struck me as, as interesting, the way that this has become commodified. Even though we're, we are in this opulent hotel courtesy of the recession, um, I... <laughs> They're, they're still trying to market a, a, certain, uh, a certain feeling, a certain sense, a sensuality uh, through their menu. And it's, it's things that touch on, on many of the current food trends. Um, in fact, you can see many of the food trends in the menu, whether it's organic, fair trade, vegetarian, vegan, uh, bioregional, permaculture, slow food, heritage, heirloom, or biodynamic. But it's all about consumption. It's, it's all about making us feel like we are in, engaged in, in some sort of um, both pleasurable and political act. And I'm not really going to talk about this in my presentation, though it, it could be something we talk about in the question and answer. There is also a very fascinating aspect to what I call the political economy of the aesthetic. When you see, for instance, a menu that says something like, you know, grilled chicken sandwich versus a Tuscan grilled chicken breast on uh, ciabatta bread under artisanal gruyere cheese, uh, neural mapping studies have actually shown that you think it tastes better. Um, the adjectives actually uh, give us a better experience. And there's a, there's a whole political economy to this, to the way that food is created, the, f the, the food is marketed, to make us uh, think that it's better. And it has a real effect. Um, you, this has actually been also shown with wine, that people think that the same exact wine is better um, when they're told it costs about five times as much. They're given two bottles, same exact wine. They're told one is an expensive French wine and the, and the other is like a cheap Alabama wine. Um, not sure that Alabama wines exist, but 
you know, I think if we were told that, we would all find the French wine to be better, even if it is the same exact thing. So out of these many different trends that I mentioned, there is a genuine concern for social issues. Um, there's foremost, these, these food movements tend to be about personal health. Um, they're, they're all about uh, the, the obesity epidemic, about living a healthier lifestyle, about getting away from uh, pollutants uh, in, in the body. Environmental issues do play um, a big role, particularly the issue of sustainability, as do ethical choices. For instance, many people are obviously vegan and vegetarian because they don't want to eat meat or animal products. There's also aesthetic concerns. Um, I actually have a culinary background, and I do tend to favor uh, things such as farmer markets, but it's, it's more out of aesthetics um, for the taste, the quality of the food. And there are people who make food choices, though I think they tend to be in the minority for even political issues. In other words, they want to have an impact on the climate crisis by <laughs> shifting away from ener energy intensive food production and lower their carbon footprint. <clears throat> now the main effect of this is lifestyle politics though. It's to make people feel better about themselves and it's not, it has very little impact in terms of changing the dominant um, agro-food system as it's known. Now sustainability is a key factor in all these in all these movements. is There's concerns about social uh, sustainability, in other words, the obesity epidemic. Um, we know that it looks like the current generation, um, what is it, the millennials or whatever, it looks like they're going to have a shorter lifespan uh, than their parents. And a lot of this has to do uh, with the type of foods they're eating, the lack of exercise. Um, there's also economic considerations in terms of sustainability. This has to do with labor, the cost of commodities, and social reproduction. In other words, can people reproduce themselves um, through their food purchases? And this is, we see this most dramatically, especially in organic food and uh, farmers markets. Like I said, I love going to farmers markets, but it's like how many people can afford to pay $6 a pound for tomatoes or $8 for some loaf of artisanal bread? Then there are ecological concerns of sustainability. These have to do with issues such as energy, land, <laughs> soil, GMOs, chemical inputs, and all, all their impact on ecological devastation and degradation. Now, there's a real problem, though, for all these new, new food movements. They're basically two paths that they take, absent a radical change in our social and economic relations. Either a food movement will be co-opted by the agro-food industry, has as has organic food, or to remain a high-priced niche market patronized mainly by yuppies and food fanatics such as with the farmers markets that I mentioned. Now there's a deeper issue with the, the new food movements. I think they're a form of commodity fetishism. Uh, what, what happens is that the foods, the foods become imbued with a certain concept separated from the use value. The, the, real, the real value of food, of course, is in the, that it provides us with nutrition and calories. But in terms of the commodity fetishism, it's no longer a social relation between people, right? That's what a commodity is. It's about the relation between la uh, laborers, the relation <coughs> between labor and the land, the relation between labor and capital. But to quote Marx, in commodity fetishism, it assumes the fantastic form of a relation between things. In other words, it becomes the relation between the exchange of the money form for a commodity. What does this mean practically? What happens is that we begin to see food as satisfying emotional needs, such as comfort. For, in for instance, there was a huge uh, spike in uh, the sales of snack foods after September 11th. Uh, because people were looking f uh, f uh, to food as comfort. And so there was something like a 30% rise in salty snack food products after, after the 9-11 attacks. Um, food is seen as satisfying lifestyle needs, in other words, purity, freedom from chemicals, health needs, food as medicine. Um, this is something fascinating. Every time a new food tends to be introduced, and we see this with like acai, goji berries, it's introduced often first as a medicine. This, this was the history of sugar. Sidney Minson, Sweetness and Power, talks about how the introduction of sugar was originally one of its key roles was as a medicine. Of course, we would consider that absurd today. But just because um, that was absurd back then doesn't mean that this same phenomenon isn't still 
still happening. Foods also uh, are seen as uh, serving social needs. This is particularly true with the slow food movement, um, that in other words, the role of food is to build communities. Again, it's not to give basic nutrition or uh, caloric intake, it's to build community. And, and there are many other ways, sexual, religious, etc. So what commodity fetishism does, it conceals the social character of private labor and the social relations between the individual workers by making those relations appear as relations between material objects instead of revealing them plainly. In essence, labor becomes invisible. So to the consumer, all that matters is the organic label. Uh, one of the largest, uh, there's one dairy, I think it's Horizon Dairy, that produces most of the organic milk in this country. They're basically doing it on an industrial scale, and the Consumers Association of America has been going after, Organic Consumers Association of America, has been going after them um, and, and trying to get the FDA to decertify them because they're basically doing it in a, in a way that is not organic but they have enough power in the marketplace that they're able to retain the organic label. And so the consumer, all that matters is the label, not really the relations of production. So we also have a, an increasing phenomena of organic produce being grown in the third world of land um, that was once rainforest with um, on large uh, corporate scale industrial um, <laughs> agricultural systems where, where peasants and uh, native uh, peoples are displaced from the land so they can produce um, high value added organic products for the Western market. Um, and in this country, what we often see is organic food is often prepared by undocumented workers. You know, this is something that, again, we don't see. We go to an organic restaurant, we think we're consuming something that's, that's good for ourselves, good socially, good environmentally, and yet it's, it's still using the, the same type of dispossessed marginal labor. And so this all gets hidden um, in commodity fetishism. <clears throat> so like I said, what this really is, it's, it's a system of, uh, of lifestyle politics. And the primary uh, framework is individual action as solution to the various crises, economic, political, social, ecological. And the reason it's individual actions, because then it can be easily commodified. What we do is we consume the image of change. So Nestle's has introduced a fair trade Kit Kat bar. Budweiser <laughs> has craft brews. And of course, McDonald is, McDonald's is a leading owner of Chipotle, uh, which markets itself as an organic, sustainable fast food chain. So these are very easily adopted by capital. And we even see this within, within the food movement. Um, Michael, Pollitt, Michael Pollitt, he's he's an excellent writer. Um, I think he's very sharp, but he's also one of the leading apologists for the corporate food system, um, from Whole Foods uh, to Walmart. If anybody sees Food Inc., um, which I believe he served as, a, as one of the producers, they're basically saying that Walmart is part of the solution because they now offer organic milk. And we've also seen now in, in the last year or so how a lot of celebrity chefs have, have, joined, have jumped on this bandwagon. And what it's about is they're not trying to change a system, it's this is the latest trend. So you have people like Jamie Oliver, Rachel Ray, and Paula Dean who, who've made their careers out of offering the most unsustainable, the, the fatty, fattest, unhealthiest foods imaginable. And now they're, they're trying to present themselves as ad, uh, leading advocates in the fight against obesity. Yet what this is really about is burnishing their brand and, again, engaging in a new means of profit accumulation. So rather than look at the relations of consumption, what we need to do is look at the relations of production. And we should see that there are two, two dual movements. There's the local and organic versus industrial and global. Of course, there's a lot of overlap in those two, especially with, with what Pollan calls the organic industrial complex. But nonetheless, we can see that there is kind of these, these fragmented niche uh, local food movements, and then you still have this large-scale agro-food system that's being articulated. Now, what corporations want to do is they their role in all of this is they want global sourcing um, of foods, uh, commodities. So, in other words, they want to be able to buy sugar from anywhere in the world, corn, soy, wheat, the basic inputs at the lowest price possible because they want to create um, high value uh, at high high at value added brands. So, say in the case of Doritos. Um, uh, 
a bag of a two ounce bag of chips will cost you ninety nine cents. Uh, the the price of the corn in that is one half of a penny. Um, so, but what they're doing is they're creating high calorie but low cost foods, right? From that ninety nine cents bag of chips, you're still going to get a lot more caloric intake than what you can with ninety nine cents of broccoli. But at the same time, because they're able to source this food so cheaply, it, it's high profit. And so this this is one of the, the big contradictions of the current moment. The the reason why all these food movements I think um, tend to be niche is because of the high cost. There's there's some structural reasons for this. For organic food, um, because they don't use uh, artificial fertilizer, um, their their yields are lower, so they're not able to produce as as much uh, products per acre. So the cost is greater. What this means, the cost is greater to the, to the consumer. But for the consumer, especially in this country where we, we have uh, almost non-existent uh, social welfare and social support networks, the overriding concern is cheap food as a means to social reproduction. And this is something that's gone on for hundreds of years. This goes back to the corn laws that Marx talks about in Capital, um, where the industrialists were trying to get uh, the corn laws overturned, which basically prohibited the import of, of grain uh, because the landed aristocracy wanted to keep the grain prices high. But uh, after decades, by the mid-19th century, they were able to get the corn laws overturned because what that meant was then the uh, bread prices went down so industrialists could pay the workers less money. So the, the cost of social reproduction goes down. And we say, see the same exact phenomena going on today with Walmart and China. Walmart allows people to socially reproduce themselves cheaper to be, because it is able to produce so much food. And much of this is now coming from China, um, where, including organic uh, products, where the food can be grown incredibly cheaply and without any concern to the externalities in terms of environment, labor, social costs. So I want to just go quickly through um, what's known as the agro-food system. What I've been talking about, obviously, more is the, more of these niche food movements, but we have to see it in relation to the dominant food system because this is what 99% of people eat in, in this country and around the world. Now, the, the whole global food order actually goes back hundreds of years, and you can, you can date it back to the um, enclosures of the commons, which uh, pushed small farmers off the lands um, in Europe and led them to become settlers in, in overseas European colonies. And what you had in uh, the colonial era is also a dual system. You had tropical slave plantation foodstuffs and temperate meats and grains to feed the rise of the industrial sector in the mother c country. So this, this food system, it underwent a, a number of changes, but the, the key thing is the post-World War II order. Now, before World War II, what you had was the legacy of the interwar period food regime, where it was in interdirected development. In other words, countries like uh, the Soviet Union, the United States, Britain, they were looking to develop internally. So their food policies were concerned uh, with internal matters. In the U.S., what the New Deal did was it set up a system of uh, uh, commodity price supports, um, commodity loan programs programs to keep farmers on the land. There, there was a, a great fear that there would be a huge amount of farmers that would flee the land, um, as was happening. And so you had these commodity price supports that were created and the easy credit. But what this did was it, it created a system of continual grain surpluses. Um, the government initially uh, bought and stored these because farmers were being paid to produce, um, to overproduce, no matter, because they were assured a certain price. So during World War II, this problem was taken care of because it, w it went to feed, uh, it went in the war mobilization effort, and it went to overseas to other countries. So what what happened was um, it became a system of supporting national agricultural sectors. So what the U.S. did is it developed a strategy to dump food surpluses. It became known as aid and trade. So what it would do is it would first give uh, food aid uh, to various countries, uh, first in West Europe, and then those countries important to empire um, such as South Korea, India, and then the third world. And once they got hooked on it, then it would engage in trade. Um, so it was a, a mean, it was a mean to uh, the U.S. to be able to project um, 
its its growing agribusiness uh, interests into other countries and to develop a, a, a dominant market space. So at the same time, this food export regime westernized social diets of newly urbanized customers in industrializing regions of the third world. And at the same time, it also undermined local farmers with low price staple foods. A lot of uh, uh, revolutionary and nationalistic regimes in the third world in the post-World War II period wanted to industrialize. So they favored a policy of cheap food, but this undermined their farming sector. And when they did give money to the farmers, Farming sector, it, it tended uh, to go to males because they were the ones seen as doing the export-oriented crops that could get cash for the country, as opposed to women who were engaged in more families, uh, subsistence, um, and polyculture production. Uh, that was a more benefit for the community, but wasn't producing uh, the um, hard cash earnings that these countries wanted. And so. What this did is it created a spatial fix. In the case of the Green Revolution in India, what it, what it did was it brought into the world system a new geographical space that was restructured to allow for new profit centers of capital. I'll explain that a little uh, bit more um, later. But in terms of the effect this had on the global food system, first its biggest impact was on Europe. So Europe struck a deal with the U.S., the European Economic Community. It wanted to protect, protect its large-scale staple food production, like cereals, milk, beef, and sugar. And in return, it had agreed to allow for the import of U.S. soybeans for European livestock. The French farmer, Jose Bovey, notes, the arrival of the first soybeans in French ports, not subject to any custom duties, signaled the start of agricultural industrialization. What these cheap soybeans did was they complemented local grain production and silage, and they created a livestock complex. <laughs> so first you have the Green Revolution. This is followed by the Meat Revolution. So this drove a common agricultural policy geared to guarantee high prices in overproducing cereals, generating food uh, surpluses for export. The practical effect of this, again, was a, a vast reduction in the farming sector. In France, uh, within 30 years, over 90 percent of the farm population was eliminated, uh, eliminated, particularly those engaged in polyculture and subsistence production. And what it did is it, cr it hastened monocultures and farm concentration as a survival tactic. Now, what this system also does, it's a system of food security versus food sovereignty. Food security is a concept that's associated with the state system, so that states want to have food uh, security. This was the New Deal policy, that the U.S. should be able to produce enough food for itself. Food sovereignty is a non-state concept concerned with political and economic rights for farmers as a precondition for food security. Food security has come to depend on the agro-industrial model. Food sovereignty is rooted in agro-ecological relations. Now, there is a further shift that happened during the 1980s, starting with the Uruguay round and then in 1995 under the WTO. Essentially, food security was shifted from the nation state to the world market. And this, this was policy under the Reagan administration saying that there's no need for countries to be able to uh, provide for their own food when they can get it on the world market. But what, the, what this went hand in hand over the last 30 years with the U.S. Um, using international financial institutions like the World Bank, WTO, and IMF to dismantle national systems of support. So they dismantle grain boards, uh, storage systems. Um, and we see the effects of this in 2008 with the global food riots around the world because whereas countries used to have up to 100 days of uh, um, food stores in, the, in, uh, in their nation, um, in many countries it was less to 30 days, <laughs> down, down to less than 30 days. And because they had to buy it on the open market, which was subject to speculation, uh, even, though the food wasn't, uh, even though the food was plentiful, they weren't able to afford it. And I'll just also point out that uh, um, this is the same exact story if, if 
uh, in a book that's well worth reading, Mike Davis, Late Victorian Holocausts, where he goes over the famines of the late 19th century and shows how it's the exact same process. So what's happening today we shouldn't consider unique by any means. This is the same story of capital uh, restructuring the global food system to be in the interests uh, of the market, the traders, the speculators, and which means essentially causing a widespread uh, death, even to the point uh, of a genocidal scale. The famines of the late 19th century um, in India, China, Africa, South America, they killed uh, from 50 to 100 million people. Um, and it was all very easily preventable, but it wasn't in the interests of, of the capital, capital class. So today, liberalization and privatization are the operative rela relations which privilege corporate, corporate power. And what this corporate system does is it rapidly concentrates, centralizes, and coordinates global agribusiness operations. Again, another tre trend that's deeply disturbing uh, that is somewhat new is uh, countries are going in with uh, their allied national capital um, and buying enormous swaths of farmland in the th third world, particularly Africa. For instance, South Korea, in conjunction with Daewoo, tried to buy something like six million acres of arable farmland in Madagascar. It was over half the country's uh, arable farmland. Um, except the thing was they weren't going to buy it. They struck a deal with the uh, president of Madagascar that they weren't going to pay a penny for it because they were going to quote unquote develop it and uh, uh, leave behind an infrastructure. Of course an infrastructure that would be extremely high tech and capital intensive and no use to the people whatsoever. And this actually led to a coup against the president. But nonetheless, we've seen other countries do it, especially newly developing countries like China, India, and Saudi Arabia. Last year, they bought over 50 million acres in the third world, particularly in Africa, with the idea that they're going to grow massive amounts of grain, uh, both as food and biofuels for their home market. So today, the world agricultural and production system is controlled by perhaps 10 transnational corporations, such as Monsanto, Cargill, ADM, Novartis, Bayer, Nestle, BASF. <laughs> What's striking about this is a lot of those names you wouldn't recognize as food corporations. They're chemical or drug companies. And, and this, is, this is what really the, the new order of the, of the global food system is. Similarly, at the distribution end, especially retailing, it's controlled by a relatively few giants, such as Tesco, Carrefour, and most of all, Walmart. For instance, in Mexico, three out of every 10 pesos spent on food is spent at Walmart. So today, the food system, the food regime has completely dispensed with concepts such as development and national self-sufficiency in food. Food is constructed, and this is what I was talking about as a spatial fix, to provide for a series of inputs, energy, especially heavy oil, natural gas, chemicals, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, biotechnology, heavy machinery, transport and storage, rail systems, shipping networks, grain elevators, storage warehouses, and all the concomitant technology required to run and manage this. And so here's where we see the real contradiction of the local food systems, right? It's like if you want to go ahead and have have, go to the farmer's market or try and grow your own food, you're welcome to, but you're not going to overturn the dominant food system. Because when you look at the all the networks of capital that go into it, you're essentially fighting <laughs> virtually every single aspect of capitalism. And this is why the agro-food system is not going to go away on its own. We just can't opt out of it. It, w it will continue to dominate uh, the global food system, and it will co-opt whatever it wants to, uh, to its needs. And because most people cannot afford the high-priced high boutique foods in these new food movements, they're going to con they're, they will go through the agro-food system. So all of this, though, is not something that happen happens in the free market. This is all abetted by the state. Uh, uh, Karl Polanyi in The Great Transformation talks about uh, laissez-faire was planned. What he meant by that is that uh, the free market system is based on government regulation of land, labor, and finance. And I would add to that the environment. 
So in the 1970s and 80s, the U.S. changed its system from price supports. In other words, it used to say, like, okay, a, a bushel of corn will be $5, you know, if the cost of production was $3. What that did is it assured farmers that they're going to make a profit no matter what. So... But now what they're doing is direct payments to farmers. And so this completely ch turned the system on its head. What this means is the, the largest agribusinesses get massive subsidies from the government. Um, something The U.S. Uh, gives out something like close to $100 billion a year in agricultural subsidies. But more than 80% of that goes to 20% of the farms. So practically what that means is the cost... The, the cost of food now on the, on the open market is below the cost of production. And so what that does is it favors the big traders and food processors. So the, the ADMs, the Cargills, they can actually buy the foodstuffs cheaper than it is to produce because of the system of U.S. subsidies. And this is the exact same thing that Europe and Japan also do. So they can buy, buy it cheaper than it is to produce. And if you can buy corn cheaper than it is to produce, what that means is unless you're a massive corn farmer and, and, and in fact, a huge corporation, you're going Going to be forced off the land. Um, at this point, there's so few farmers in the United States that the census has stopped including them. They've stopped counting them because they're less than half a percent of the population. Um, th this has been uh, reduced from about 4% in 1970. In 1940, it was uh, 18%. So they're largely disappearing. Because then these traders also have these massive surpluses, they can then dump them into uh, in the third world. And so what you see is a dual movement of deruralization in both the global north and the global south. So we might celebrate all these small farmers, uh, all these local farmers, all these organic farmers, but the fact of the matter is, is that the, f the farming sector continues to shrink and shrink, and particularly uh, for small farmers in the United States. If your farm is um, making $100,000 or a year less of income, um, there's an 85% chance that you're actually losing money on your farm. Uh, the vast majority of these farms, they actually make the money from uh, one of the household or multiple members of the household going into the workforce. And so these small farms then become more of a hobby than an actual system of production that can be socially and economically sustained. So how am I doing on time? Um, so I, I'll, I'll end with um, some thoughts from uh, Via Campesina. Via Campesina um, is a large international network of uh, uh, peasants um, from uh, throughout the developing world. And they're one of the groups that has taken a leading fight against the agro-food system. And what they really try to do is promote the issue of food sovereignty, as defined as food being produced through diversified farmer-based production systems. And they define food sovereignty as the right of people to define their own agriculture and food policies to protect and regulate domestic agricultural production and trade in order to achieve sustainable development objectives. In other words, people should determine the extent they want to be self-reliant and to restrict the dumping of products in their markets. So actually, I think I'll, I'll just end there. Um, and you know, one thing I do want to talk about is solutions, um, but I'll leave that for a question and answer. Thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm glad uh, I, I skipped the veganism because I was hoping someone would bring it up. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think one of the ways to, um, you know, I, I don't know if, if, I know this kind of gets to the heart of the problem of veganism. Um, I'm not why I say that all vegans do this, but many vegans will uh, say you can't eat honey, but it's okay to eat sugar. So practically what that means is we can't eat this product, honey, because it's made by an animal, bees, and we're supposed to avoid all animal products. But we're allowed to eat a product made from slave labor. 
Um, and this, I think, re really gets at the issue of veganism. Now, I, I was a vegetarian for seven years myself. I've read P Peter Singer's works. Uh, you know, I, I think it's it's very hard to, um, in fact, might well not be impossible to come up with, you know, a, a really good defense of uh, being able to eat animals, even even though I do, um, particularly if if you come from a Western society and have the means where you don't need to subsist on animals. But at the same time, um, I think. Veganism, you know, as as while it's sure it's a great uh, personal choice, and and I support anyone who wants to do it. I think when it starts to become a movement, that's where it starts to really become problematic, um, because uh, what what it does is as um, that one person um, in the back said, it's it's kind of. One, it's based on changing through consumption, you know, that the free freedom somehow occurs through the market. You know, it's a form of uh, neoliberalism in, in that way. Um, but m more than that, it's, it's, I think it's part of a postmodern affliction where we see all struggles as completely equal, where we don't want to prioritize any one thing over the other. And it's where somehow uh, class struggle it becomes the same in some semiotician looking at the signs and signifiers of resistance in a homeless person's cardboard box. And it's like, no, you know, it's, it's like oh, the type of cardboard box a homeless person is sleeping on is not the same as engaging in class struggle. And the, the problem with veganism and vegetarianism as a political movement is animals cannot engage in class struggle. Um, and the, the point is to change society. And so that doesn't mean we should endorse cruelty towards animals, torture of animals. Um, but it, at the same time, I think trying to elevate it to, <coughs> to this totalizing political struggle um, is, is also going to fall apart. It, it, in, in the end, it tends to just become moralizing and scolding. Um, which you know, I'm sure a lot of people have encountered from vegans that somehow you're bad personally um, if if you eat meat and 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 you know you somehow support rape and violence and war um, if if you eat meat. It's because what it tries to do is take a particular lifestyle choice and elevate it in, into a whole kind of um, ideology. Um, so in in terms of the argument about resource intensive intensiveness again you know th this is it's based on systems of production um, you know we, we can there, there are many uh, the production of organic produce in the Imperial Valley in California um, it being shipped 3,000 miles across the country is not sustainable um, yet if I wanted to assuming I could find a relatively cl clean river if I wanted to go out and fish and, and eat eat meat, you know, that is sustainable. Or there are plenty of places where, you know, deers are essentially like oversized rodents. And if I wanted to go out and, and hunt, um, that that is also sustainable. Um, so, you know, it doesn't have to, again, it's not something inheres in the product itself. This, I think, again, it's, it's, it's kind of similar to commodity fetishism, that we see somehow the product as inherently bad. We have to look at the relations of production you know, from kind of the social alienation that, you know, this will give us community. And, you know, Marx has a lot to say about alienation. I think there is also something very powerful about us being uh, alienated from the land. And I think, you know, this, this is kind of a tangential point, but I think there's something also fundamental to think about where, you know, the most successful resistance struggles historically have tended to be, of course, peasant-based struggles, whether that's because they were tied to the land um, or not, you know, is, is questionable. But I think, you know, even if we look at this day, um, few people resist as fiercely as the Palestinians do because it is a struggle about the land. And yet we, we are all alienated from the land. We don't have that type of connection uh, to the land uh, that the Palestinians do or that all sorts of indigenous native struggles have had throughout history. So I think there is something <laughs> fundamental there, and I think the food movements do really tap into the fact that we do somehow feel alienated, not just from the product of our labor, um, but, you know, the product of our labor coming from nature and the land itself. One, one thing I did mention, but I do want to um, talk about a little more, is, is the issue of what food has become. Uh, in the petrochemical industry, oil is what's known as feedstock. Um, in other words, oil is just a product that is then 
you can create tens of th thousands um, of uh, it's oil is a raw commodity you can create tens of thousands of products out of so it's a feedstock for the petrochemical industry that is what food has become um, it is no longer about satisfying basic needs. It is a feedstock. So for corn, you know, this is well known now, there's something like over 7,000 uses for corn. Corn goes in everything from batteries to diapers. They're virtually every single uh, food product, uh, processed food product you eat has corn and, and soy in it. Um, and, and then, of course, they're biofuels. Uh, you know, so the food is produced not to, to basically... Um, feed us to sate our appetites to provide for a basic level of subsistence the purpose becomes how do we increase profit for capital you know it's how do we create new means of profit and I think the, the whole thing one person brought up the issue of free time um, that that's a that's a, a fascinating issue because it's, it's kind of like what that one gentleman was talking about that there were actually celebrity chefs during the Roman era right that this is nothing new um, but in, in the book, one of the books I mentioned earlier, Sidney Mintz's uh, Sweetness and Power, it's his discussion of the role of sugar in the social uh, reproduction of the English working class in the late 19th century is absolutely fascinating. By, by the late uh, 19th century, um, the working class were eating uh, over 100 pounds of sugar per head per year. Um, and tea became incredibly important. People essentially lived, the working class lived on, on tea and bread. It's because women had moved into the workforce. So we, there is this kind of imagined past, you know, that uh, women were, became um, uh, producers, were, were producing income for the household, so they didn't have time to, to cook anymore before there was this kind of ubiquitous, like, vegetable stew that was always... Um, <laughs> Uh, on the on the uh, oven or stove or whatever they had, and that's provided a significant amount of nutrition, and it provided a very varied amount of nutrition. But this really switched to tea. Why? Because you get uh, energy from the sugar, you get some uh, nutrition uh, and protein from the milk, and then of course you get the the stimulants from both the sugar and the caffeine. And people were constantly drinking tea all day long, um, and because this became a very easy way for people to get their caloric intake and to be able to reproduce themselves socially because the, the British Empire policy of free trade drove down um, the cost of producing sugar and tea and and so it you know these these things all work together and so you end up with a system that in many ways looks like the the system of today where we don't have free time now of course this did you know, in the U.S., it was some, somewhat different. In the early 20th century, um, the average household, and of course this was virtually 100% women, spent about um, two and a half hours a day um, in food production. Um, I think the latest statistic is it's down to something like about 11 minutes a day. Um, and so, you know, and that's really not much more than uh, kind of uh, tearing off the cover off that Amy organic uh, chicken pot pie, sticking it in the microwave, uh, stuffing your face, and then throwing the trash away in the can, even if you bother to do that. And so, yeah, so we've now even seen for vegans and uh, vegetarians that there are a huge amount of ready-made products that the same system of agro-food um, production has now been able to capture this market with high value added convenience foods and so it's still participating in pretty much the same exact system you know and often you're still buying from the same producers that are still producing all the uh, horrible meats and other products that you're buying and so the, the thing is if you want to be a vegan great you know I think that's that's a great individual choice but I think to start scolding other people, you know, it, it's, it starts to become borderline like anti-working class. And it, it, this is not to idealize a working class, you know, that somehow everything the working class does is wonderful, you know, because obviously there are many working class who are racist, sexist, and homophobic. But at the same time, you know, the constant, our focus really needs to be broadly what is the system of production. Like I said, we can see many types of uh, systems of production where it doesn't have to be destructive or cruel. As, as one example, I have a lot of friends in uh, um, upstate New York in the Finger Lake regions who they engage in their own food production. Um, they, a lot of people up there 
uh, keep hens uh, for eggs. And um, one time I was up there, uh, a friend of mine is like, hey, I have this uh, one old hen. She's pretty old, um, and she um, hurt her leg. It's time to put her down. So uh, I, she asked if I would uh, do the deed, and I was like, sure. And, you know, this hen had a good life, lived out outdoors, um, had laid eggs for many years, and we grabbed it, cut its head off, and uh, turned it into a really delicious chicken soup. Um, and there was nothing cruel about this. You know, this if we hadn't done it, this hen would be picked off by a predator and probably die a much worse death. Um, this wasn't a commodity. Um, you know, we th these eggs weren't, weren't being sold. This wasn't in some uh, factory farm. So we can't be moralistic and say somehow all meat eating everywhere, every time, every place is bad. We have to really focus on what the system of production is. Thing I, I think, yes, you know, that, that food choices are often a construct. Um, but we also have to leave a, a large place <coughs> for agency. Um, particularly co collective agency. And I know, uh, say, within the, um, you find within a lot of uh, black urban communities, there's a tendency to see, you know, kind of vegetarian food uh, outside of Rasta communities, at least, as a white people food, um, you know, like eating. And that real food is kind of like hamburgers. And, and bacon and, and, you know, this really heavy, fatty food. But a lot of this is also tied up with a loss of kind of shared uh, social history. You know, in, if, if you go back like 40, 50 years, there was also much more of a tendency for people in, in not heavily urbanized areas, but semi-urbanized areas in, in working class and poor communities <laughs> to have their own gardens um, where they would be growing their own vegetables. And, and so what that meant is that people uh, were engaging in self-production. When you're growing your own vegetables, if a lot of other people are doing it, you then tend to share. Um, you, you'll share products among each other. You'll also share knowledge in terms of food preparation, et cetera. And this is also a time where people tended to labor much more. They were much more physically active. You know, so there is a shared history that, that we've lost, you know, that a lot of the working class has, has lost. So, you know, we, we shouldn't, like, see that somehow what exists now is fixed and immutable and, and it can't change and it's completely constructed. It, there's a lot more complex issues of agency. But, you know, one thing I do want to say is, like, we definitely need to be aware in ourselves is how food is a signifier of superiority, privilege, and class status. Um, and so, you know, when you're talking about, well, you know, it's like I only eat, you know, I only drink like shade-grown coffee that's grown by a lesbian Mayan collective. <laughs> you know, it's it's what what, what you're what you're doing is is you're give, you're you're saying. You're really saying I'm superior to you, you know, be, because all these adjectives give me a certain sort of superiority to, uh, to, to anyone else. Um, so I, th I think that's one of the most important things to look at. I think uh, the point about uh, the low fat um, and the rise of obesity was also a good point. Like this was, it was encapsulated by one product. I think they're called snack wells or something. Mm -hmm. You know, th this is, this is, I think it's, it's a non-fat product. But what happens is, well, when you have a non-fat product, what do you do? You pump it full of sugar. And this is actually a phenomenon with the uh, uh, school lunch program, that because they have to meet these certain nutritional requirements and these certain calorie levels, often what they, they find is like, well, the fat content is too high, so we need to bump up uh, the amount of calories to reduce the fat percentage. So they'll just add like a, a sugar product as part of the meal. Um, and so then sugar becomes an, an easy fix. Yeah, the, the, the whole issue of uh, um, whether small and or organic farms are sustainable under capitalism, I visited a lot of small, uh, you know, like uh, permaculture, biodynamic, organic farms, and virtually in every single case, either some member went out uh, in the household, went out into the workforce, 
they relied tremendously on free labor um, or they were a not-for-profit and they always talked about how they couldn't compete but I think we need to change the terms of the debate and that we have the corporate food system is anti-competitive they don't want to compete you know the the big grain traders the big processed foods they want monopoly control they hate competition um, and the, the subsidies are a way to ensure that you cannot quote compete against them in any ways um, what one one thing more that I do want to say about veganism it's you know again you know it's like personally I think um, pacifism or not even personally as a political choice uh, I think you know pacifism is the proper political choice. I call myself a strategic pacifist, though. Why? Because I'm not suicidal. You know, I, I encounter plenty of people, especially young guys, who talk about we need to form our own militias, and I'm like, yeah, right, you're crazy. Um, <laughs> and I was like, look, you know, if if we were really in in a revolutionary period, you know, we what we would be doing is recruiting the security forces to our side. The people already have this knowledge, and it's like I'm not against war. In, in and of itself. I support revolutionary wars, but we all oppose capitalist war, right? So we should oppose capitalist food production. It's not opposing meat eating in every single interest. Again, if you want to do that for religious, ethical, spiritual reasons, that's fine, but I don't think you should impose that on someone else. It's a capitalist system that we're uh, opposing. Now, in terms of solutions, uh, I think there is one food movement that does start to get a little bit closer to what's a solution, and that's community-supported agriculture, because you're dealing directly with the producer. But again, you don't know, is that producer using you know, marginal uh, labor, i.e. undocumented labor, or are they exploiting that? A lot of community-supported agriculture, they, the, this is, if, you, if you're not familiar with it, you buy a share directly in, in a farm, you, you get a, a box of goods, and it's actually really cheap. You would save a lot of money doing it, but it presumes that you have, you know, the time, the knowledge, uh, the facilities to be preparing uh, a lot of ingredients, and that you're feeding enough people. You know, so it, it, there, there's still all these things it's premised on. You know, but what it tries to do is completely cut out the middle of the commodity chain, but you're still not sure exactly where that farmer is getting all their labor from. And often these farmers depend on the people buying shares come and doing free labor on their farm. So again, that's not really a solution. I mean, what we really need is, uh, is local agriculture for most everything. You know, most everything we can consume can be, uh, probably about 80% of what we, we consume could be done within a 100 miles radius you know but it has to be worker and community controlled the land has to be worker and, and community uh, owned it has to be uh, run in the interests of the community you know the workers need to have uh, a direct say in terms of their working conditions the, the, the control of the work site and that's what we should be shifting the subsidies to. You know, if we can uh, afford to spend $100 billion a year, we should completely take it away from uh, supporting the large agribusiness and transnational corporations, and we should be supporting, you know, the, these small uh, local community and worker-controlled farming systems, which I think can, can provide uh, much of a good bit of the solution and can also start to be an area where we can uh, see, you know, what does does worker and community control exactly mean in, in terms of uh, overturning the capitalist system? Thank you.